Breaking the wall of neurological disorder. How brain waves can steer prosthetics. Miguel Nicolelis, Duke University. 20 years ago, I was in New Jersey. I remember being deeply moved with emotion. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great honor to be here. I would like to, first of all, thank the Einstein Foundation for this opportunity to speak to you in such a, a wonderful celebration of a date that uh, relates a lot to me too, even though I was born in Brazil and was at that time 20 years ago studying in the United States because I remember very vividly this day uh, because for me, from our colleagues, around this time, 20 years ago, we are learning to do something that to us was the break of a small but important wall. At that time, we were learning for the first time to read signals like this, to read a true brainstorm, a brain symphony. 10 seconds of 100 cells of a brain that was thinking, that was producing motion out of vision, out of abstract information that came from the world, trying to reach for it. At that time, when we first reached this milestone of reading 100 neurons, the electrical activity produced by 100 brain cells, we had no idea what would uh, come in the next two decades. It turned out that just in 10 days, we realized that by being able to read these thoughts, these very small snippets of 100, 200, and now almost 1,000 cells of millions of neurons, brain cells, that produce everything that we are, everything that we actually do, every hint of the history of mankind since the beginning to the end, we realized that we could break another wall, that we could actually relieve the brain from the constraints of the body and liberate these symphonies, this brain activity, these waves of electricity from the constraints of our biological being so that we could actually allow brains to enact their voluntary will directly without the interference of our flesh into machines. This is what we built 10 years after we started listening to these uh, symphonies. Uh, we built a brain-machine interface combining ways to listen to the electrical storms that brains produce, carrying information about motion, information about voluntary will, and by using a series of mathematical and computational and engineering tools, we are actually able to extract from these raw electrical signals the type of information that could be used by this brain to directly control an artificial device and use this device to enact its will in the world, either next to it or very far from it. By instrumenting this uh, new artifact, this artificial tool that became part of this brain's voluntary will, we actually could send messages back from the brain, whatever this tool was located, and then not only use our usual sensors uh, like vision and touch to decode these information, but actually send information directly back to the brain in the language that the brain can understand electrical waves. Well, this was very important for us neurobiologists because we could use this information to test a series of hypotheses, a series of theories on how large populations of neurons in the brain code information. But our dream, the true wall that we want to break in the future is represented here. We want to actually use this knowledge and these brainstorms to directly restore things that some of us millions of us actually lose without uh, the knowledge of the, those of us that actually continue to live our lives normally. Uh, we all know that if there, are a severe, if there is a severe lesion to one part of the brain, like the spinal cord, the messages that we produce in our brains about motion, about moving, about exploring the world, cannot reach our muscles, can no longer command our body to move at will. Well, although these lesions occur, our brains for the rest of our lives continue to produce the messages, continue to dream about motion, 
about this impossible task that most of us perform without even thinking about, but some of us can no longer do. Our idea is to use brain-machine interfaces, the linkage of living brain tissue to devices that we build with our brains to actually restore motion to these patients, to use the electrical activity decoded with computational models and then use this to command a new body, a body that these patients would wear, a robotic device, an exoskeleton that these patients would wear like they wear their own bodies and then move through the world. I'd like to show you a simple example to illustrate how this concept works because we already have made it in animals, something quite like that, but not the final, the final uh, uh, goal, not reach the final goal. This is a monkey that actually learned to walk like we do, bipedally, in a treadmill. While he was doing that, we decoded, we recorded and decoded hundreds of brain cells uh, the activity of hundreds of brain cells that actually produce the commands for the body of this animal to actually move in this treadmill. This information was transformed in digital commands that were then used to reproduce all the step cycle that this animal produces when he walks in the treadmill. This is some of the patterns of just a few cells of the hundreds that we can now record in brains like this. And when we combine this electrical activity using very simple computational models, we actually can reproduce very well the step cycle, the, the whole locomotion pattern of these animals in a variety of patterns. Well, at that point, we realized that we could right there try to break a, a really major wall and try to liberate the electrical storms the brain thinking, the brain activity of this primate to see if we could enact its will very far from its body. So it was that time that having a monkey walking at Duke University in the East Coast of the United States, together with our good friend Gordon Sheng at ATR Kyoto, ATR Robotics in Kyoto, we designed a protocol that allowed us to send brain signals from this brain all the way to Japan so that we could fulfill the dream of a humanoid robot, CB1. And the dream of a humanoid robot, you probably all know, is to behave like men, to behave like a primate. And that's what was done. The signals were sent to Kyoto, and video images from CB1 walking in Kyoto were sent back to Duke to be projected in front of this monkey. All, all this around the world trip, 20 milliseconds faster than it takes for a brain activity to be produced in the brain and reach the body, the muscle of that brain body. So that brain-machine interface around the world resulted in this more recent experiment. Uh-oh. You should be seeing a robot walking. I see it here. Unfortunately, you cannot see there. But I swear, it's true. <laughs> Let me try again. That's very bad. Maybe this would work. Sorry. I apologize. It worked on the test, so I don't know what is happening. No. Oh. Uh-oh, now you're, you're going to the end. On time, I suppose. No. <laughs> no, it's the next one. So what you should be seeing, I'm sorry, was this uh, robot, CB1, walking autonomously under the command of the brain activity that was broadcast from a monkey that was walking at Duke University. So the legs of these, the images of these legs were projected back in front of this animal. And what we learned at that point was that as we stopped the treadmill and Idoya, our monkey, stopped moving in the treadmill, the robot continued to walk. Idoya just realized that she just needed to think about moving because the object of her desire was moving. So she didn't need to send the signals back to her legs. She just needed to imagine because we could send these signals to whoever wanted to walk over the cost of a monkey brain. This is what we want to do. This is the future uh, for us. This is our future wall to break. This is a whole body exoskeleton 
that my good friend Gordon Shea is developing right here in Munich to actually be commended in the future by the brain signals of a body that cannot move anymore. Uh, the brain signals of a person that is paralyzed and we hope we'll be able to take advantage of brain machine interfaces to regain mobility and once again roam freely around the world. This is our approach for treating body paralysis using brain machine interfaces. But there's something more. This is going to be a project distributed around the world. We are going to do this, we hope, achieve this task to a non-profit consortium of laboratories all over the world that will collaborate, providing their expertise to build this brain machine interface for millions of people to benefit from, including the laboratory of my good friend Klaus Miller here, the Technical University of Berlin, uh, the, the laboratory of Jean Rossier in Paris, the uh, Swiss Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Gordon Schenk at the Technical University of Munich, the Institute of Neuroscience of Natal, the International Institute of Natal, Brazil, the Syrian Lebanese Hospital in Sao Paulo, and the Center for Neuroengineering at Duke University. But there's more, because we cannot now not only read and listen to signals, to symphonies from the brain, but we can just recently learn, we just learned to send messages back directly to the brain. We actually can, using electricity and light, deliver small messages back to the brain, hoping to recover, restore, and correct the effects that we find in a variety of neurological disorders. One of them is Parkinson's disease. And as you know, millions of people are afflicted by this disorder. They produce uh, clinical uh, pictures in which patients cannot move. They shake. They cannot move, they cannot initiate movements, they lose the ability to coordinate movements correctly. We learn from using transgenic mice, mice that have been altered so that they, genetically, so that they can express the symptoms and signs of Parkinson's disease, that the reason, one of the possible reasons for the symptoms that we see in these animals is that the brainstorm in, in these animals are all synchronized. Brain cells fire all together at the same time in the motor cortex and in other structures of the brain. So what we did was to send a simple message to these brains, an electrical message upon detecting these synchronous storms, we delivered an electrical signal to the surface of the spinal cord in the back of these animals, very superficial, non-invasively. And what we saw that I'm afraid you will not be able to see given what happened with CB1, uh -huh. you see, we Brazilians, we never give up. Aha. Uh -huh. No, I try everything I could think about. I'm sorry, it did work on the testing. <laughs> In any event, what I was going to show you there Right here, this ma mouse is Parkinsonian in the beginning of this movie. And is he staying in that corner without being able to move because he's shaking, is severely Parkinsonian. Upon the delivery of this electrical signal to the spinal cord, we just disrupt this synchrony that the brain is producing. And these waves of electricity now can be produced out of phase, randomly out of phase. At that moment, instantaneously, this mouse can walk again, can move again. And as long as we produce, we introduce this little noise in the brain, the brain will behave like a normal brain of a normal mouse. So this is rapidly moving to the clinical stage, and if it works, it's going to be a very simple procedure, a procedure that can be used in every patient that suffers from uh, Parkinson's disease. And we will be starting a new dialogue, we will be able to start with these simple messages, start talking to brains directly, trying to establish this conversation that we hope in a few decades may bring down the terrible walls of neurological disorders. Thank you very much.